So I'm now turning to Professor Wendy Olson, who is a Professor of Socioeconomics at the University of Manchester. And Professor Olson has a long record of working with qualitative data. And Good morning. She's here, come here from Manchester, Manchester to visit us. Yeah. And I am going to actually ask her the same sorts of questions that I've just been speaking to Elena about. Now she's developed, you have developed a way of working that actually also is able to work with very large volumes of data. But I think without giving up on the practices of qualitative research, the more conventional practices, yeah. and you're still using, yeah, and you're still mm -hmm. using in vivo. Yeah. So I wonder if you could just tell us yeah. how you manage to bring that together yeah. with what is really more data than most people could read. Yeah, sure. Well, the methods that we've developed could be used for quite large data sets, but you stand on the shoulders of giants. So there's actually one article in the um, International Journal of Social Research Methodology, and that, that actually is the basis for what I've done. But their programming was so complex, I thought, oh, well, let me simplify this and use NVivo and Excel. So I'll explain my, my sort of starting point is a realism, like critical realism and discourse analysis. That's really where I'm usually coming from, seeing social change in terms of how people I interact in the world. And I can say more about that when we have the longer talk. But in this um, sort of methods initiative, I've tried to look at how keyness, that's the, the degree to which a word is key in a text, how that can be used to pick out a couple of hundred or a few t key terms from any text. So we had, for example, 47,000 words of text was reduced fairly easily to 230. And that I can just see on one page, and I can then examine them in terms of what am I going to work on, where do these things fit together, how do they fit into discourses that are patterned. And so when you reach the interpretation stage, which is so important, you can see the dominant discourses, and you can also see people doing things that are creative, divergent, deviant, marginalized voices can come out around those dominant discourses. And that's, a, that's a, a, to some people, a strange thing. But for me, that's not at all surprising, because every single study that I've done has had both dominant discourses and these changes. So Norman Faircliffe calls that intertextuality, when one discourse permeates another or in, somehow is inter, inter-embedded with it. And he says, we must ask why. So my work is totally based on earlier works by realists like right. Norman Faircliffe. Yeah. So you've been talking about keyness and yeah. when a word is key. Could yeah. you just explain to us how you identify this yeah. key? Sure. So it's, it's based on a ratio. So there is a little numeric stage of matching and comparing rank. Um, but your own corpus of evidence, uh, say if it might be semi-structured interviews, that has many thousands of words. And then we compare that with the words that are found in the whole national corpus. And each of those has its own word count. But we take the ratio of the uh, prevalence in the one to the prevalence in the other and then rank on that and that it turns out that really produces a list that's ranked in terms of how interesting they are or how key they are and this was something that was written about in the International Journal for Social Research Methodology by Turi in 2014 so I am taking that idea directly from Turi and from, link, from Corpus Linguistics but it turns out very useful for discourse analysis it's mm -hmm. sufficient to get us the, the key topics and then we can indulge in going into detail and depth on those topics to do our interpretation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just to just in case anyone's not quite grasped the, yeah. the corpus you're talking about yeah. is the British national corpus. Yeah, it's a body of language and they've converted oral and radio and so on into text langu language, that's transcription. And all these transcripts are thrown together, millions and millions of words in ordinary usage. And then that's called the corpus. But we each have a corpus or body of our own work. So the, the mixed methods material that we have, especially the qualitative side, goes in en vivo, and that's my little corpus. So I'm really looking as keenness at the relative prevalence of a term, a word, in my corpus relative to the British national corpus. So I'm interested in this difference between you. Um, I think, Wendy, you're focusing on discourse, and Elena, you're, you're focusing on a thematic analysis. Can you just tell us, um, Elena, how you see thematic 
what a theme is to you? Uh, in relation to large data sets, uh, I think when we go through all the comments that contributed to creation of the concept, you are, uh, I mean, you are trying to pick up themes, the main topics, the key messages that are coming out from um, from the from your data set. But uh, when you've got uh, three, four, six thousand of at, uh, of quotes, utterances that contributed to creation of the concept. Thematic analysis could be very challenging. So this is where you uh, keep analyzing until it reach some sort of saturation. So when new themes, new topics, new messages are not uh, coming out anymore from your data set, then it, it will be kind of end of your exploration. And this is where I would be kind of happy and content in relation to the meanings. Yes, and that's when you're using Leximancer as a, a yes. short a shortening way of that. Yeah. And so now I want to ask yeah. Wendy, because you're doing something rather different and you're you're I'm going beyond that. I'm not it's I'm not disagreeing and I think it's amazing if you have a program to do the sort of network analysis of terms and see how they fit together. That's really you know it's helpful. But I'm definitely wanting to go beyond that. So can you explain to us how you see discourse? Yeah, well, discourse is a set of rules, really, for how we interact. So say here we're being very polite, two are silent while one speaks, those are the rules. And we can break the rules, we do, but the rules exist, so that's discourse. And then if you have, um, if you have a very conservative idea of society, you might think, well, it just is that way. That's just how it is. So I'm going to describe how it is and get on with it, and I'm done. And that's sort of how you sound it. But my view is that the world is changing, and as it changes, I and you and all of us doing research are trying to influence it, actually. So we always want to be aware of the marginal discourses, not just the dominant patterns in language, but actually to see how are people using language to challenge dominant patterns in society. And dominant discourses reflect real power and real relations in society, whereas the marginalized voices or the unusual people who are deviant, uh, vegetarians would be an example, they need <coughs> to use the existing language to do something new. Sure. So they challenge the dominant discourse. But using how do you... So the maneuver that you're making to get from your identified the words that are key with this ratio that you've explained to us and yeah. how do you get from that to your discourse? Step one is to find what topics they're about. So that is probably the same step as, as what you have been doing. Find out what they're about. So say agriculture. Step two, look for differences in how people approach that. So as an agent, a person speaking is doing something. They're not passive, although they may do a lot of things habitually. So the usual language about agriculture is to grow stuff and to produce, and if there's a drought, that's a crisis. The marginalized discourse we might find, and I have found, is one that says, there's a crisis in agriculture due to my yeah. children hating it. We don't find respect sure. in it. We, it's a disaster that my, my new okay. generation can't continue to produce because they don't even want to live in the villages. But to get to this, you're going back to your detailed reading. Yes, back to the same so, evidence. Yes. So the detailed reading, reading can be summarized using the concordances. Yes. The, around the key term is the set of language that's surrounding it. And you can quickly glance through those and see what you soon see the dominant discourse. That's okay. easy to spot. The trick for social scientists goes beyond linguistics, beyond what is considered, I think, normal in grounded theory, way beyond that, and says, no, we must also look at what's happening that involves an attempt to change things or a concern about change or a reaction okay, against no. pressure. It basically power plays. Great. And that's why we have the word tropes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.